Ours was arroyo. arroyo. Yeah, and I found out there's like seven different species of willow that grow out here. Yeah. So I think any, almost any species would work. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks to everybody. I want to thank the Coast Miwok, the Creeks Symposium team, and also the college. I'd also like to say a prayer for um, Judy Schriebman, and uh, she's the director of the Galenus Watershed Council. Please, everyone, wish her well. And uh, I, I am representing the Galenus Watershed Council. We call it the GWC. So if I say GWC in my presentation, I'm referring to the Galenus Watershed Council, which is the watershed council that uh, is where the Civic Center of Marin, and because I'm in unincorporated Mill Valley, I don't really have a local place to go. So basically can only go to the Board of Supervisors, and that has become my watershed. So I'm an adoptee. Uh, we've been working with the GWC to basically promote and advocate for water quality in the Marin Civic Center Lagoon. The lagoon is part of the Frank Lloyd Wright historic monument and legacy. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, as you can see here in this picture. It is a retained fresh water body. It's in the natural lowlands. It is fed by a spring, by rain, and by both surface and subsurface runoff. And as you can look in this drawing, see there's trees that are perforating the building. It was not supposed to have a plastic roof. It was supposed to breathe and incorporate uh, basically like a living machine. The building was included and the fresh water retained in the lagoon. You can see along the edge of the lagoon, it's almost entirely diverse vegetation. That's Frank Lloyd Wright's design and we would like that to be respected and we'd like to return to that design. So uh, his vision was one of harmony with nature and um, it's 60th anniversary, so it's about time we get there. Uh, the issues that are causing the water quality decline, annual problems and often impairment, uh, are the fact that there is no living edge on the lagoon, the fact that there are acres of lawn of non-native uh, grasses that are kept cut, and there is no structure, no diverse vegetation, and so the geese have a fabulous feast. It's like a salad bar for geese, and uh, they have no, also no structure, diverse vegetation on the edge, so there's no threat of predation. They can enter the water, exit the water at will, and therefore they become permageese. But it's not their fault. It's the management, right? Every, every system requires management. For 1,000, 30,000 years, people managed this area for fertility, and they did a, such a good job that it's taken us, well, almost 200 years to draw down that fertility to where we stand now, whereas if we turn off the pipes, I, I wonder if any of us know a place to go find water. So this is a big issue. It's an environmental issue. It's our health. It's everything. Right now, um, we could basically take the concrete off the edge of the lagoon and restore it, and that would help us get a long way. What I'd like to say is there's things we can do. We can remove the concrete. We could add diverse native vegetation around the edge. We could get rid of the lawns or at least add you know, some complexity and diversity to them. We could increase the habitat. It would become a beautiful place to be. It would be full of life. Right now we've done surveys. There's almost 100 species of birds there that we have observed. And there's all kinds of life, but if we support, there's river otters in the lagoon when it's nice and you know, in the, after the rains come. So we could, we could support that life and it would support our lives as well. People go walk there. Um, it's been, it's been impaired now on an annual basis to the point where we had the fish die off in 2020, where thousands of fish were found floating in that lagoon. I'll just run through a little bit of our history. Uh, in 2002, at the, there was a conference that was happening in the Civic Center for almost 30 years, I think, or over 20 years, called the Bioneers, Biological Pioneers 
called the Bioneers, and they brought people of ecological knowledge and vision together with indigenous folks to help promote environmental thinking and environmental solutions, ecological solutions. We heard John Todd there in 2002. Judy and I were there. We had a visioning session of how to clean up the lagoon. Then on 2012, the indigenous sunrise ceremony that used to open the Bioneers Conference was canceled by the county because there was such low water quality. Um, that, you know, the past, in the past, the 20 hottest years have been in the past 23 years. So we're only going to get more and more of this and we need to do what we can to create a healthy environment for all of us. So um, in 2014, Alex Call, Dan Monte and myself were students of the Environmental Forum of Marin and we took on the health and water quality of the Marin Lagoon as our master class project. We went to Judy Schriebman and the GWC to join the Galenas Watershed Council and we became the Civic Center Watershed Restoration Project. We've done now nine years of citizen science. We have four years of water testing data, two years of professional water testing that we paid for, three years of bird surveys. We've worked with students at the Marin Academy with uh, macroinvertebrates, and um, they did a macroinvertebrate study and an otter study. We worked with Tara Linda High School and the School of Environmental Literacy, and they did a survey for us of the lagoon health and you can take that survey we have a QR code on our poster uh, so please if you're willing you can take that survey um, what we found were basically there's an annual pattern of decline after the rains stop uh, because of the Mediterranean climate that we're in the rains you know stop after in the spring and we have dry almost seven eight months of dry weather and um, what's happening is the water temperature goes gradually up the saturation goes up, the dissolved oxygen goes down, the water quality goes down, stagnation goes up, nutrient density goes up, alkalinity goes up, and there's an increase of potential of algae blooms and fish die-offs. What's happening is the waste from the pathways and the lawns adjacent to the lagoon are being washed directly into that water body. That's the maintenance regime right now. Uh, what we're saying is in order to protect the waters of the lagoon, which is a freshwater body, it's an important resource in East Marin for wildlife and for people, we need some structure. So we, have, we made three recommendations. Have a living edge. You can see the diversity of structure and how the, the waste that's coming off the lawns and the pathways would go either into you know, across and be trapped by plants, or it would be caught in a, a more of an engineered solution, which is a bioswale, but that allows you to retain a concrete edge along the water body if you need it, but you would have an infiltration basin where plants and soil would be able to at least receive some of that nutrition before it hits the water body. So our third recommendation was floating islands, which caused uh, the county to do nothing and so they chose to go in that direction which was fine you know and we are we were willing to go ahead with it how the system works is there's um, you deny the plants of soil the roots are therefore forced to pull it's a hydroponic system in a way the roots are forced to uh, pull the nutrition straight out of the water the enzymes on the roots is what jump starts the ecosystem with the micro little micro invertebrates and all the little creatures that then become eaten by bigger creatures and bigger creatures, and that's how it works. It also provides cooling by just being shade on top of the water, which is very important in a shallow water body like the Marin Civic Center Lagoon. So um, you can see we worked with a great firm, Biomatrix, and they came up with this design for us that focused on hexagonal modules, so that would be in alignment with the design of Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, you can, what's very interesting is that as the floating islands jumpstart the ecosystem and the plants uptake the nutrition and the fish and the return and the birds return, everything starts to function and go quicker in the nutrient cycling, the benthic layer, which is the siltation at the base of the water body, starts to draw down and you actually get a deeper and cleaner wa water column. And I think that's also very important at the Civic Center Lagoon. Just 
Um, we liked Biomatrix, but they use a plastic mesh in their system. Every commercial system available right now on the market uses a plastic mesh where the roots twine into that mesh. And um, so we decided we would get away from it. We stopped our project. It was a hard decision. I made it. And I went to Indigenous Wisdom and I said, please help us. And I found Monique after searching for a long time. <laughs> Haku. So we've got we've had two in there, and this is our third one. The first one we did um, was made out of willow, and um, Judy has willow on her property. Her husband was very happy for me to come and chop down all their willow, and um, you know you cut it back and it grows again. And so willow is a really strong material. We use it for traditional <coughs> basket weaving, and it lasts a long, long time, and it can carry its weight. So that was perfect. So. Um, we started with a, a bamboo frame, and I um, wove a willow tray and uh, onto that. Well, the first one, I think I wove it in through the bamboo. The second one, I wove a se tray separately to pl be placed into the bamboo, and we'll probably do that with the third one. And then the um, third material I used was um, tule. Tule is a reed. It floats. Um, it's lightweight, and um, it's woven. It can be woven a lot easier than the willow. You can um, weave the willow after you soak it, but it's still a, a stick. So it's, it's more of a, um, if you use the big ones, it's more of a large open weave. And um, I've never woven anything this big. It's literally six feet tall. And, um, and kind of brought it up on the edges. The edges we thought would maybe deter some of the birds from coming in. It did not. <laughs> um, and so they really like to eat the plants that we planted in. So there's the willow. This is the first um, attempt. And again, I wove the willow through the bamboo, and we wanted to use hemp rope. Well, that disintegrated in like six months. So we had to go back in and, um, and add another, another, I think we pulled it out, and we did the second, um, the second flotation. Um, here's Aurora in, uh, was it the beginning of the summer? Um, putting in the plants. So when we first started the first, um, flotation we did, we put it in Judy's pool to make sure it floated, and it sat there a little too long. And um, so the second one, we, we um, wove it right away and put it in the water so that the willow would sprout. Because, you know, it, it, I, I cut it and we wove it really quickly, and that, that worked pretty well. So that kind of helped with the, um, the sustainability of the, the mat itself, the, the tray itself to hold, and the willow roots will actually help the whole um, the whole process come together and hold it together. And then you can't see the tool anymore because that's covered. Judy actually had um, some roots, some root system that she pulled up, a big mat, and we put that on top of um, the, on top of the tule layer. We thought that would help with the roots. We didn't want anything to fall in um, just in case. So that's kind of what you see there. And Aurora putting in the, the plants. Let's see the next slide. So here are uh, the benefits with that. Um, the, Plastic floating island that we did and the ones that the biometrics do are very expensive. Um, where the floating island that I'm creating is all traditional materials. So we're always looking for good places for willow and tule um, and maybe some other, some other materials. But these are ones that I'm really familiar with. Um, uh, it's completely biodegradable. You've got your carbon neutral or veg um, vegetative. Um, there's other research out there that I think we can apply to this process. But um, right now, putting the, the flotations out is probably the most expensive in, in um, uh, manpower. And then, um, again, avoiding the do-nothing plan and um, the cost of pumping water, and then the project drawdown goal. So if anybody, again, has these materials and um, would like to have them cut down, which is a big process, but I think we could do it. We definitely appreciate that. And if you have any questions, we have our, our um, poster out here in the back. And yeah, that's the end of my time. Thank you. Um, I think if we're going with the plastic systems, it's around $50 a square foot. And if we go with the 
biological systems, it comes down to around $25 a square foot, almost. Um, and I think it would be great for people to see what's going on that way if you have something to contribute, whether it's resources or, or um, um, you know, labor, that kind of stuff. I think that would really help. Um, what we're looking at is like 300 of the floating islands to cover that lagoon to be, um, to do what we want it to do. So that, that's a lot of work. It, yeah, that would be 2% islands. of the surface area <laughs> right. of the lagoon. And that's the average formula. Between one and three percent, between one and three percent of the surface area of any water body, regardless of depth, is required to provide the biofiltration. If you think about it, that's about what a, like a natural water body that's permanent, you know, not ephemeral. So we're replicating a living edge by floating it out there in the water. If you look at your own body and you look at your hair and the places where you have hair, I bet it's the same percentage, between one and three percent.